Mike Dunnett, I would ask you to uh, escort Mr. Tom Burns up to the stage. I had to make him sit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Long time no see. Yeah, hey. Tom Burns, the younger brother of Chris, was a gifted multi sport athlete who excelled in baseball, soccer, hockey, and volleyball, earning him Miramichi Valley's Male Athlete of the Year in 1995. After a stellar career as an all-star goalie with the MVHS Palamu, he was a member of the St. Thomas Tommies of the AUAA in 95-96. Although having a passion for hockey, it was the baseball diamond where he truly stood out. In 1994, he was chosen as a member of the NB Midget Selects. In 1996 and 1997, he helped lead the Cardinals to back-to-back -to -back Provincial Junior Championships. A league all-star, he won the batting title and was selected to play in the 1997 Canada Games for New Brunswick in Brandon, Manitoba. His 18-year career in the New Brunswick Senior League with the Newcastle Cardinals, Cardinals and the Chatham Ironmen was outstanding. He picked up a provincial title with the Ironmen in 2011 and a Canadian National Championship in 2001 with the St. John Alpines and with the St. John Alpines in 2001. The Alpines would be inducted into the New Brunswick Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006. From an individual perspective, Tom would be selected as a first team All-Star 10 times and play in 10 national championships. He was selected as the tournament's top offensive player in 2011 and Tom placed in the top 10 NBSBL hitters of all time with a 369 average in 1,061 at-bats. Well done, sir. In two th 2022, he was placed on the Chatham Ironman's honor roll. Since retirement, Tom is, is passing on his knowledge to the Miramichi youth as a volunteer soccer, baseball, and basketball coach. He is a welcome and deserving addition to our wall. Well, it's probably going to be a tough one to follow. <laughs> Story of my life, right? <laughs> Big brother shadow, literally, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Miramichi Sports Hall of Fame Committee for the induction and um, congratulate all the inductees tonight. I'd especially like to acknowledge the Wood and McKay families. <laughs> Man, <I'm laughs> I uh, no, I had the pleasure of knowing both Scott and Woody. And, um, man, <laughs> they, uh, they're both truly, uh, um, deserving of this induction. So, congratulations. I can honestly, I can honestly say, I always say chance favors the prepared. I say to the kids that I coach, wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was extremely proud as an athlete to represent my community, both provincially and nationally. Um, it's, uh, it's something special to wear the Cardinal and the Chatham Ironman logo um, when you're <laughs> when you're playing uh, playing a game that you love. I'm going to tell a little story about how it all began. Maybe I can snap out of this and come back to myself here. Uh, uh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Go right out the door. So this is how it all started for me or how I remember it starting for me. On a warm June Friday night, I had, uh, it was my first year playing organized baseball. I'd always played on the street with Chris and his friends or in the neighborhood in a field. And uh, this was my first year playing. So it was a little bit of a struggle, you know, playing against guys that have been playing for their whole lives and stuff. And, and uh, I just remember uh, one Friday evening, it was really warm. I hadn't had a hit yet. I was really struggling, trying to fit in. Uh, and it was a, we were playing at the Willie Journey. <laughs> So 
So on the slab for the Bantam arm in that night was a rather extra large chunk of a lad by the name of Patty Quinn. <laughs> not even joking. I kid you not. And this is the truth. Patty, you know what? Believe it or not, Patty was a pretty good ball player when we were kids. Besides the fact that he was like 10 sizes bigger than all of us, especially his head. I'm right here. I know you are. You're really hard to miss. Trust me, you're hard to miss. Kid. <laughs> he, uh, you know, he was actually a, a pretty decent player. He was, he was a, a, you know, a decent hitter, but he was more known for his, his uh, left, left-handed pitching. So, uh, my first at bat, I, I definitely struck out. He fed me a plethora of slow, slobby curveballs. Thank you. <laughs> That's why he's the best. <laughs> And uh, so when my second bat came around, I said, you know what, I'm just going to get after it. And uh, like I said, he, I said he was a pretty decent player, but what I didn't say was that he was very bright. <laughs> so after my first bat of curveballs, he decided to unleash probably about a 54 mile an hour fastball. Probably better described as a meatball, and as everybody can see here tonight, he knows a thing or two about meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, I fought it off the fist and blooped it in for a, uh, an opposite field double, and then my career was off and running. So, thanks, kid. <laughs> it wouldn't have hurt, trust me. <laughs> to say this is a special evening wouldn't be you know, doing just to uh, what it actually is. Um, having the opportunity to be inducted alongside my brother is, uh, is truly special. This part might be hard for me to get through, <laughs> but I will do my best. <clears throat> Chris was, uh, can you guys all hear me? I know what the, okay, good, yeah. Chris was, <laughs> Chris was a hero of mine growing up. Um, you know, he, uh, he was part of the big three on the Newcastle side, which included John Cannon and Michael Dunnett. And uh, they were, you know, three phenomenal ball players and athletes and people that, you know, any, any kids, you know, would want to model themselves after. And, and uh, you know, I uh, didn't have a, you know, Chris, there's five years between us and once Chris left for Rhode Island, he didn't come back. <laughs> Just, you know, a couple summers here and there, but, um, you know, growing up with two other brothers, three boys in the house created a perfect storm for me and that perfect storm was from a competition aspect you know you took your lickings from your big brother but when the time came you kicked the snot out of your younger brother as often as you could <laughs> and I definitely took advantage of that um, you know to this day uh, Chris and I have always had <laughs> fiercely competitive our wives can attest to that you know there's times where you know, we can't play golf, we can't play ping pong, we can't write speeches. <laughs> when Chris arrived Wednesday night, he was probing me for information as to what I was going to say, and I was kind of doing the same, but neither one of us said anything. So it was just, <laughs> we held it both pretty close, trying to make sure that the other one didn't have the upper hand. So, <clears throat> however, so far I'm giving the edge to you. Uh, you know, I, Chris and I, aside from our physical differences, him being six foot eight and all, and me not, uh, <laughs> you know, I never thought that uh, I was ever in a shadow. We were two different players. Like Chris was a, you know, a, a dominant pitcher who, who had a phenomenal slider and threw from the side, and made hitters look ridiculous, and he hit really long home runs. John can hit long home runs. Chris hit really long home runs whenever he caught them. <laughs> And uh, they, were, they were fun to watch. There was one time, and I believe it was Woody, to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't have a lot of, at this point in my life, Woody was more Chris's coach. And he was around our team for the candy games or midget team or something. And he, he said, well, that's Chris Burns' brother. He must be able to pitch. <laughs> well, little did Woody know that I have the hands the size of a cabbage patch doll. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> they didn't do me any justice. I couldn't pitch. My pitching out may lasted one inning, actually one third of an inning after giving up six runs and never asked me to pitch again, so which I was more than happy with. <laughs> Chris left for Rhode Island. We didn't get a chance, like I said, when he was home. Uh, I didn't get a chance all that often to see him play due to my own playing schedule, but any chance I did get to get out and watch those early junior Cardinal teams, they were phenomenal. Some really good rivalries with the Ironmen over here. Like, people don't realize the talent that was on the river during those years and, and uh, some phenomenal players, and it was fun to watch, man. It really, really was. The 95 Nationals, for me, was probably the proudest, um, up to that point, the proudest moment that you know, I, I, I could share with Chris. Um, like I said, he, he, I'm going to echo a little bit of him. Like he's, he stole a few of my lines, as I mentioned to Tara. I didn't think he was going to mention the pneumonia thing. <laughs> but he got me on that one. He was phenomenal that, uh, that day. And uh, to this day, I know there was a, a, a pretty cool write-up. And some of you guys, some of you folks may have it. And, and they alluded to... It was no longer called Sunday, it was called Burns Day. <laughs> uh, one thing I will say though, I didn't, under, I didn't, under, I didn't realize until tonight, and, and I'm being completely honest, is I didn't realize Chris was a scout for the Dodgers, so thanks a lot for that. <laughs> thanks for giving your little brother a look. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to, I, I, sorry, I also have to comment on the 98 season. So it was, Chris was texting me during the, or a couple weeks ago, and we were trying to put things together for tonight and wanting to make sure that we both don't sound like idiots. And he said, uh, you know, did you and I ever play together? And I looked at my wife and I said, Nick, I said, that's the biggest part of my speech was that great year. 98 was my favorite year. <laughs> and he had absolutely zero recollection of the two of us ever playing a full season together. I'm glad it meant as much to you as it did me. <laughs> I'm beyond proud of my brother Chris. He's uh, relocated to Florida. He's a wonderful family and wife, Carla. Um, we don't get to see each other as often as we should. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he is the reason why I wear number 37. I promise I'll be quick. Well, yeah. <laughs> I had the distinct pleasure of playing for both the Newcastle Cardinals and the Chatham Ironman over my senior baseball career. Um, you know, it's spending eight years, the same amount of time with uh, both organizations was, you know, it wasn't something I don't think anybody else has ever had the chance to experience. Um, you know, my early years transitioning from junior baseball where I had some, some pretty good success. Um, and coming up and, and having the opportunity to, like I said, to play with the big three, John and Chris and Michael, and uh, to get to spend time and coached by you know, Robert Stewart. And, you know, there wasn't a better man you'd ever meet than Gary Dunnett. And, uh, you know, and to spend time with Huey Wood, Max McAllister, and Ronald McCombs. It was a great organization. It was, a, it was the perfect time for me to, uh, to make that transition. And I was, I was very happy that I did. And it was a, uh, a big part of my big part of my childhood and into my adult life. In 2005, I made the move of the big long drive across the bridge to join the Chatham Ironman. <laughs> and I have to say, it was the right move, it was the right time. I was accepted with open arms from Greg Morris and Daryl Matthews. I joined a first class organization. Um, man, all we had to do was show up. That's all we had to do. And a beautiful ballpark. And Greg and Daryl did everything for us. And, uh, you know, they really were, they were committed and dedicated to putting a winning product on the field. And, you know, for, uh, I'll tell you, all eight years, we were good. We were very good. And, uh, you know, some years we put it, you know, we, we put it together one year for sure. But, uh, you know, I like to thank Daryl and Greg for uh, accepting me. And, and uh, but I do have to say this. I, I will have. Before I was able to come over and play, I know who was behind it. Actually, Terry Leggett. So Terry Leggett set up that my wife had to go on a date with Al Sutherland before. 
before I was allowed to play. So I'm not sure if I should thank Terry or if I should thank my wife Nicole for going on that date, but it led to uh, uh, you know an amazing eight years, and uh, it was a it was a great time. So. And I think I forgot a sheet. It's all good. <laughs> I definitely forgot a sheet. <laughs> Who said something that I didn't know how to count? Was that you? It might have been. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, acknowledge, or sorry, I wanted to acknowledge some of my teammates, the great teammates I've had over the years. You know, having the opportunity to play for both organizations, both storied franchises, was you know. Excuse me, was was special. Uh, Michael and Mark Dunnett, John Can, Jamie Henderson, Ronnie McCombs, Terry Leggett, Jason Dixon, uh, Dave Godfrey, Maddie Jenkins, and of course my two brothers, Spark and uh, Chris. Like I said, was, this place is a hotbed of talent. It was, and, and hopefully it will be again someday. Uh, to make this evening, I know I made reference to this being a special evening and stuff with the induction with Chris, but when I learned that my favorite teammate of all time would be escorting me, I guess, or presenting my award. It really brought things full circle for me. Uh, you know, aside from being a gifted player, a tremendous teammate, um, it was how Michael Dunnett carried himself off the field, on the field, that uh, really left a, an impact on me. Michael taught me about the game, especially during those early years. Um, you know, he, he always taught me, he said, you know, he, he used to call me Brain, he said, Brain, play as if someone's always watching you. And, uh, and I literally took that to heart, and I, and I played that way throughout my entire career, as if somebody was always watching. Everybody talks about the 95 Nationals, but what probably most people here don't realize or recognized is our 2001 team and Michael and I had the chance to play for the St. John Alpines and probably what was the last true national championship in Canada where there was 11 teams so all 10 provinces were represented and and uh, the host team and we were loaded we were that was probably that was definitely the best team I'd ever been on we had guys that didn't play that were league all-stars and in halls of fame and just it was, it was loaded and it was uh, you know, it was during that week for me where Michael separated himself from the good players to the great. And it's not just what he did in the field. It was phenomenal in the field. It was flawless defense, which is the norm for Michael. And he, I swear to God, he did hit 800 for a tournament, which is also, that's pretty good. <laughs> but it was his leadership and... Uh, you know, the way that he blanketed the team. It was some, there were some excitable moments that week. As, as it's hard to win a national championship. It's really hard. It's not easy. You've got to get a lot of breaks, and you've got to have good players, and things have to come together for you. And there were some excitable moments at times. And, uh, you know, we just looked at Michael, and I swear he just, it was one of those times he just said, you know, get on my back, and I got you, boys. And, and he truly, truly did. Um, but like I said, it was uh, it was the way that he carried himself. It was the way that he, he conducted his business that uh, you know really separated himself from the uh, from everybody else. I'll tell you one thing about Michael quick. I, I, I know I got to move on. I know you guys cronk blasted me earlier. He said you only got two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> As he looks over his glasses, hurry up. I'll say this about Michael. You can learn a lot about a, a person's character by the way they treat younger players. From day one, uh, Michael treated me in a way that said, come on, I got gotcha. you, I'm going to help you. The great ones see and react to everything that goes into winning. That's when you know you have someone special. That is Michael Dunnett. So thank you, Michael. It was an absolute pleasure. With all these great teams, you need a leader. You need someone to uh, steer the ship. And I've had some great coaches over the years. Robert Stewart, Sean Wood, Greg Morris. 
I always loop Daryl into that, <laughs> uh, as well as, as uh, Gary Dunnett. Bus rides and late night clubhouses, closing the clubhouses were, uh, man, those, those were fun, fun times, especially in the younger years. Probably not so much fun when after you're a little older and had children, but uh, definitely fun, great stories during those years. But there's, you know, there's always one coach that uh, you hope to encounter in your lifetime. And uh, oh. <laughs> that coach for me was Mike LeBlanc. Kronk is a player's coach. Kronk is one of those guys that was you just absolutely love to play for. He'd run through a wall for him. He was brutally honest, a tad bitter, uh, <laughs> but definitely a tell it like it is type of guy. Kronk's pre and post game speeches are that of legend. Kronk could come in mid between periods or after innings and tear the paint off the wall. He was he was that good. Uh, you know, you knew you were in for something good when he started talking out of the side of his mouth, <laughs> which he did most times. I will tell a quick story about Kronk. I was in my first year of junior baseball and, and I had some struggles. It was, a, it was a bit of a struggle transitioning after having some success in midget. And, and uh, I may, after a loss in Fredericton, I, I remember I may have upset a chair or two in the visitor's clubhouse. <laughs> And uh, I just remember Kronk coming around the corner and there was no one else in there and he just kind of blasted me a little bit real quick and he said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I just kind of turned my attention to him and I vented. I vented. I, I, he sat there. He sat down. He, he, he uh, listened to what I had to say and I know it was five, ten minutes of, of pr me probably just soaking more than anything. But he, uh, he sat and he listened. And keep in mind, Kronk is a history teacher. He's highly educated. He's been a sports guy his entire life. Like I said, his pre and post game speeches are legendary. And when I was done venting, I turned and I looked and I just was waiting and hoping that he would say something enlightening to kind of bring me around. And here he was sitting in the, in the clubhouse with a moose head light. And he takes a drink. And out of the side of his mouth, he looks at me and he goes, Well, Fleaburn. You can't pee like a puppy and play with the big dogs. <laughs> you know what? I got it. I did. Like, you know, I guess I'm just that simple-minded that I got it and it stuck with me and, uh, it, and it clicked. But Kronk is, uh, you know, Kronk has become a, a member of our family. He's a permanent fixer at my daughter's games. He's, uh, you know, he's Sophie's godfather. That's how much Kronk means to me and to us. <laughs> so I just want to say, <laughs> huh. thank you for your guidance, your friendship, your wisdom, and the time invested. Thanks, Kronk. This is awful. Uh, sorry, I want to thank my grandmother. Um, which Chris made reference to. <laughs> you know, we didn't have a typical childhood, but uh, you know, what we did have was love and support. And uh, <laughs> she always made sure we had what we needed. So, thank you. <laughs> I definitely want to thank my in-laws, Barry and Pam Walsh, the help and support over the years with the girls, especially during my playing days. Uh, is greatly appreciated. Barry's become a season ticket holder for Ironman Games. However, when he gives me the post-game summary, he doesn't chirp the newer players the way that he did me whenever I swung and missed. So, <laughs> go figure that. Uh, I have to give a special shout out to my mother-in-law. Somebody who knows something about looking good, Pamela. You know, for years everyone would say, you know, they'd always make comments on my pants. Something else I picked up from Michael, I always, I always thought that if you looked good, you felt good, you played good, which was his motto, and it was true. But I, I always got comments about my pants. How many pairs of pants do you own? I own one. Well, how do you keep them so white? I said, well, my mother-in-law. <laughs> and then it became, well, my mother-in-law washes mine, and it was a simple answer. My mother-in-law loves me more than yours loves you. <laughs> so thank you, Pamela and Barry, for everything. Uh, 
Uh, I want to thank my girls. It's not uh, Gracie, Kenzie, Sophie. You know, it's not always easy growing up at a ballpark, and I'm sure that uh, there were other places that you guys would have rather been. Um, but you know, I have to say, judging by how much you guys still love going to ball games and, the, and, and going to the park, uh, you know, there were, there were worse options <laughs> out there. Um, beyond proud of each and every one of you, I'm proud to be your dad. Uh, you guys are destined to do great things in life, and I love you all. I'm coming to the end, I promise. <clears throat> I want to thank, of course, my beautiful wife, Nicole. Um, without you, there is no us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to play as long as I did, and to, uh, when you have a family, especially when you have a family, there's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of compromise, there's a lot of commitment. And, uh, you know, I thank you for your, your patience, your understanding. <laughs> your love and your support. Short summers, we, we know how short our summers are. And to, uh, I know there's times you'd rather sit at the beach or be at the pool, but I have to say, there you were lugging the girls to the game, sitting in the stands and, and giving me that smile and the nod whenever I did well. And uh, the old get your head out of your ass chats whenever I didn't do so well. <laughs> and those are the ones I probably appreciated more than, than the smiles and the nods. So thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm going to close now. I've got to get off here. I know. I definitely need to have a drink. Uh, my playing days are over, and since they've been over, I've turned to coaching. And I definitely have a new appreciation for, uh, you know, all the coaches that I've had over my life. It's a, it's a full-time job. It is, as my wife can attest to. There's a, you know, it's a thankless job. Um, it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's something that somebody did for me, and it's a way for me to give back to my community, and uh, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I've taken bits and pieces from coaches, former coaches, and added some new cronk. I'm almost done, I swear to God. I know you're over there pulling your eyebrow. <laughs> uh, you know, I've taken my own philosophy and put a spin on things, and, and my message to my, my girls and, and some of the kids that I coach it's simple. Control your controllables. Learn from others. Love. Be passionate. Never cease trying to be the best that you can be. You'll encounter things that are beyond your control. You'll experience failures. Be better than average. Be better than mediocre. Strive for greatness. And remember, when you stumble, when you fall, and when you make mistakes both in life and in sport, immediately turn your focus to the only thing that matters. And that is the next play. Thank you, and have a great night.